What's good, everybody? Welcome to the Hefe Sports Podcast. I hope you all are having a fantastic day. Wherever you are, however you're listening, I appreciate you for stopping by and talking some sports with me today. Now, we have a very special guest joining us. This girl has done it all. She was the 16th ranked softball player in the nation out of St. Thomas Aquinas High School in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She was an All-American at the University of Oregon. And right now she's a catcher in the National Pro Fast Pitch League for the Chicago Bandits. Now, some people call her a softball star. Other people call her a trailblazer. I'm gonna just call her the GOAT. Ladies and gentlemen, Gwen Zvekis. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. I'm happy to be on and impressed at how much research you did on my background and excited to talk about it. So thanks for having me. Of course, Gwen. I'm so glad you could join me. Now, tell me, have you been watching any baseball as of late? You know what? I actually have been watching. I, I watched a ton of baseball growing up and then I kind of fell out of watching baseball. I got more into the college sports realm and college baseball is like watching paint dry to me. So I kind of fell out of watching baseball for a little bit. And in the last couple of months, I've actually restarted watching baseball. And it's been a lot of fun to, to watch the guys get to work with empty stadiums. I went to, I'm in Colorado. I went to a Rockies game last week and it was so fun to be back in that atmosphere. So I actually have been watching more baseball than I, than I had been in the last couple of years in the last couple of months. That's great. So what, how was that game? Who, who were the Rockies playing? Uh, the Rockies are playing the Dodgers, so it was fun to see that because obviously the Dodgers um, were World Series champs last year. So, right? Last yep. year? Yep. So, um, it was fun. It was fun. It was kind of a semi-packed stadium for the COVID rules. It was really weird. Every five seats were roped off. You kind of just had like your seats and your little area, but it was it was semi-packed nonetheless. It was really nice to just kick it and, and feel like the world was semi-normal again. So it was great. Yeah. So tell me, when you're watching a baseball game, you've had so much experience and like you've really just been around the sport the whole time. Yeah. Do you Are you able to just watch it as a fan or are you always like analyzing every little thing? Yeah, it's, when I'm in person, I just watch it as a fan because you can't really see the intricacies going on. I mean, obviously I have because I play a diamond sport. I have like the, the nuances of diamond sports in my mind when I'm watching a game. But when I watch on TV, I pick apart every single catcher and the way that they do things. Um, I Right now I'm seeing this huge thing in, in baseball catchers where they're like over framing balls, which is typically not a thing. Like I, I feel like baseball catchers are really like the top end artists of our, of our um, position. So it's been really weird. Um, I have, been, it's so funny you asked me that because I just got into like a really intent and deep, deep conversation with my dad about it, about how um, it's so weird seeing all these elite men, like really doing weird things behind the plate. So Anyway, yeah, I've been watching. It's hard. And when I'm in stadium, it's easy to be a fan. When I'm at home, it's impossible to be a fan. Mm. So yeah. Gwen, just for everybody who might not know about framing, can you yeah. elaborate about what that is? Yeah, so um, it's basically just catching the ball behind the plate. And your job is to make a ball look like a strike. But it can't be like I hate when I watch catchers if you see like a, a glove move, like a foot, they're doing it wrong. It's supposed to be one clean action where once you catch the ball, there's not a ton of movement, right? So you're trying, you're not trying to make strike strikes. You're trying to make ball strikes. So you see a lot of catchers, both in softball and in baseball, where they try to make ball strikes that are like drastic. So like, I, I have a rule of thumb. If it's like a ball ball, have enough respect for the umpire and just throw it back. You don't need to fool him on, try to fool him on something that makes you look stupid. And then there's also a huge thing where um, this is more on, on the softball side. I see softball catchers make strikes and they they frame it so they'll they'll move it and they'll move it out of the strike zone. So um, anyway, I'm sure I'm going to talk about this at some point. But the favorite part of my game is receiving and framing and um, just like physically catching balls. So um, that's the part of the game that I break down the most because it's the part that I feel like I specialize in the most. Mm -hmm. I love the adjective you said earlier to you said it's like artistry like yeah. it really is sometimes like some of the goat catchers that I grew up watching yeah. Yadier Molina Yadi, he's the best. oh yeah. my goodness and he yeah. just had his 2000s game so shout out to him 
Yeah. But I mean, there's a reason why he's been doing it for this long. Yeah. Like, he's got he, the best arm in the game. He's the best behind the plate, not to mention he's just like scary to look at. Like I'm intimidated looking at him no matter what's <laughs> happening. So he's great. <laughs> Yeah, you said we we're going to talk about this, but he's someone the older I get, the more I watch him play. And he's definitely, definitely the best catcher um, all around that in my lifetime that I got to watch. So I love watching Howie. Yeah, he's great. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Cincinnati Reds fan. I'm from born and raised in Cincinnati. So I don't like him, but yeah. <laughs> I, I have so much respect for his game. He's, yeah, he's really totally. good. And let's, let's jump to this right now. So I'm curious, when was the first time that you ever picked up a bat? Yeah, I was, I was seven years old. Um, I was a cheerleader previously, which anybody who knows me now would probably be like, what? <laughs> but I was a cheerleader and I really, like, I loved being the star of the show and I wanted to be the flyer, which is the one that goes up in the air. And I'm also, I've always been tall. I've always been muscular. I've always been just like a, bit, a whole lot of woman, you know? So um, they told me, no, you can't be a flyer. You are a back spot, which is basically the biggest part, the tallest person on the team that's in charge of catching people when they fall. So I was like, I do not want to do that. So I quit cheerleading and my parents were like, well, you got to stay active. So you got to choose a different sport then. And softball tryouts were going on. So I was seven years old. I went over to softball tryouts. I thought it was exactly like kickball, which I loved. So I remember my first day, I pegged a poor little girl in the back with the softball thinking that was how you got people out. Um, so that was hysterical, but yeah. So seven years old is when I started playing, which was like, I, from what I understand is like a little bit late, which is weird, but um, I have friends that started playing when they were four years old. I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh. I didn't know how to hold a crayon right when I was four. So. <laughs> seven or eight so was it love at first sight or was a little bit of a adjustment from being a cheerleader it was it was love at first sight I never played another sport again seriously I dabbled in some things in middle school and high school but um definitely love at first sight it was I was a catcher from the start never really played a different position so um I just I felt it was easy for me it was I was an angry little kid it was a good outlet for me it was it was everything I needed so um I never looked back been playing ever since hmm. that's interesting I love yeah. it my I kind of I was I grew up and I played baseball as well and I was a catcher too so there was it was pretty cool to get that start and like I don't know what it is about being a catcher but just something like Every, every pitch, like you're, I watched a video and you said like, literally you're involved with every single pitch. Like it's you and the pitcher, like it's that battle. Yeah. And that is just so cool. And I, I really hate to see it nowadays because the sport's kind of dying off. And when I go back home, I like the village, like Evendale village baseball team that I played for, they don't have a team anymore. So I hate that kids these age won't get the experience just the everyday being yeah. with your boys, being with your girls and just like enjoying the camaraderie. Totally. My, my hometown team doesn't have a team anymore either, which breaks my heart. And beyond that, it's the, the, the position catchers are dying off. Like, I feel like you see fewer and fewer elite catchers being developed throughout the years. You see a lot more people focusing a lot on hitting, which makes sense. Cause if you can hit your the coach is going to find you a place in the lineup. So, um, but yeah, fewer and fewer elite catchers coming up within a sport that's already at the youth level, at least in your town's experience and in my town's experience, um, dying down a little bit. But yeah, you're, I mean, you're spot on. Catching is the best position because you don't have the eyes and the pressure on you like a pitcher does, but you still get to be involved in every play. You're involved in the chess match. Like I, I love messing with batters and setting people up for failure and challenging them. And then if they beat me, I'll tip my cap. But um, I love being kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Like you're the man behind the curtain and uh, being involved in every pitch is, is exactly why I love the position. You say you fool people, like give an example, like, all right, I'm a, I'm a right-handed hitter <laughs> up to, up the base. I love fastballs. Yeah. What are you going to pitch to me? What do you want? Oh man. So, so big hitters. I love 
hitting hard with off-speed pitches. Mm. And I love going back to back. Usually people don't expect back to back changeups. So sometimes, and, and it, it's all about the pitcher too, right? So like I, you can't, you have to have a pitcher that knows how to hit their spots to be able to play the true chess game. I mean, yeah, you can make do with someone that just throws hard or has a good moving pitch. But if you have someone that has a few different speeds and can strategically place a ball, it's, it's over for the batter if you know what you're doing. So I love, um, I love back-to-back change-ups because no one ever expects them. And something I learned in college. So my head coach, when I was at the university of Oregon, his name's Mike White. He's one of the best men's fast pitch players to ever play. He's in like nine hall of fames. I don't even know. He's probably going to kick me. It's probably 20, but, um, he taught me a lot about pitch calling without even trying. He just taught me a lot about, it's all about setting people up. So, people usually have a tendency to be better at hitting inside or outside pitches, fast or slow pitches. Um, And it's all about showing them what they want, but not in a location that they want. So if you like something hard and in, I'm probably going to place it up in your elbows where you can't hit it or you can't get to it. And then I'm going to beat you away. I'm going to make you chase what I want you to chase away or in the dirt. So it's all about, um, and then I tell, I tell catchers, you know, when you're setting someone up, it's where your pitcher threw the ball. Cause I'm always thinking three pitches ahead, right? So if they hit this spot, this is where I'm going to go next. And then from there, I'm either going to go up, down. Like I love moving laterally. And then I love going up or down from there. Um, anyway, this is probably way more information than you wanted, but it's, a, it's just such a fun chess match, um, getting to, getting to mess with people and, batters always overthink they're always overthinking me myself and I included like I'm I wish that I thought as a batter the way I do as a catcher but then I always think well do all catchers think the way I do I don't know so anyway all right let's let's jump to your high school time so high school phenom 16th in the nation but you really went to a powerhouse in St. Thomas Aquinas yeah I did no there's so many athletes that have come out of there. I mean, the Bosa's, Michael Irving, mm-hmm. just a whole list. Like, I've, I'm pretty sure the wiki page could have its own page of notable alums and specifically in sports. Yeah, absolutely. When, when you were there, how competitive was the sports environment at that school? Yeah, that's such a great question. I would say... Um, let me just give you an example. So we had a huge signing day was a school wide event. It was like school shut down for the day. Pretty much you got all fancy in your outfit and it was all about the athletes for the day, which it felt like every day was about the athletes at St. Thomas. But, um, my class was 550 and of the 550, I think we had 60 to 70 at, or people go to college for a sport. And then I think of that, we had like 50 go D1. And then of that, it was probably like 20 athletes that were top schools, D1. So like the big guys, the Ohio State. So the Bosa's, Joey Bosa's a year older than me and Nick Bosa's two years younger than me. So I was right in between the Bosa era. I got to see both of them play firsthand. So um, it was unbelievably competitive unbelievably competitive as a football player automatically on the freshman team unless you're someone like a bosa um and then softball so my graduating class of softball nine of nine of us signed to play collegiate softball whoa which is crazy and then me and um our pitcher megan king uh were probably the two that went to top schools and she went to florida state university Fun fact, full circle moment, my senior year, she ended up eliminating us in the World Series and she won the national championship and we were ranked number one. So that was full circle. My high school teammate, one of my closest friends, um, ended my career. It was so full circle. But anyway, St. Thomas Aquinas is all about sports. That's why I went there. I'm not Catholic. I went there because it was a good school. And above all, it was a very competitive athletic program I was lucky that that was where I live but we have people come from all over the state to to go there so Mm -hmm. it's really cool it's a cool environment to be in where athletics is lifted up so much within 
um, such a young part of your life um, and celebrated. And there are expectations too. Like you're expected to win a state championship. You're expected to go to college to play your sport if you play sports there. So it's really cool. It was really, really cool being, um, you know, we, I think we won two state championships while I was there. So it was cool being a part of one of the sports that was actually really celebrated because we were good while I was there. So um, I loved going to St. Thomas. I love going back and like my, my, we have a whole wall of everyone that's ever gone to college um, for softball there. And it's like three panels long there now. And when I went there, it was only one panel long. So it's really weird noticing the passage of time within my own school that I, that feels like it was yesterday when I was there and I look back and I'm almost at one of my reunions for, for high school. So it's so strange. I know I'm old. (laughs) (laughs) That's so crazy, but my high school in Cincinnati, it's kind of similar to Aquinas. Like you guys are, I think you guys are a little bit ahead of us, but St. Xavier High School in Cincinnati, where kind of like the kind of like what you were saying, the expectations every year is excellence. State championships, like our swimming program has won like over 40 state championships. Our football program, um, yeah, we won four. We just got our fourth this year, but um my my year was the, our third so i got to win state and like from the time that i came in there to the time that i was done there it was always excellence in the classroom in the community yep. and in athletics that's it and honestly like i don't want to speak for you but i think that really helped me and it really prepared me for the next level would 100%. you say the same yeah absolutely absolutely i think um, so what you said, excellence in the classroom too, was a huge thing at Aquinas. Like it was, you were smart and you were athletic. That was, that was what you were if you went there. Um, or at least that was expected of you to some degree, depending on the sport a little bit, but still. Um, and I think that is what prepared me most for college was being able to manage being an elite athlete and also getting good grades. And I think uh, colleges value that. I always tell kids that are asking me about recruitment advice and stuff. I'm like, be the best in the classroom because they want someone that's excellent there as well. Cause that, that demonstrates uh, discipline, demonstrates commitment and also boost your team GPA. It's just, it's all the good things, you know? So um, it's the same. It was all expected constantly. Yeah. So jump into your first year at Oregon first year being a student athlete that's a big responsibility it's a big just everything like everything just is magnified so Gwen was there like an adjustment period when you got to Oregon like was there a moment I always always like to say like once I got to Louisville and once I started playing football there it was like a moment where like oh crap like I'm up here with the big dogs. I got to bring it every single day. Was there ever a moment like that with you? God, it was the entire freshman year. It was like the speed of the game picked up immensely. Like all the things that I thought I knew were all of a sudden just like in the trash can. And I felt like I started at square zero. And um, the other thing that, and I, I would be curious to hear your uh, experience, but you go from being the best on your team, whether it's the high school team, the travel team, whatever it is. And all of a sudden you're in a class in an environment where every single person there was the best on their team, every single one. So my whole class, we were all like top 20 ranked kids. Um, We all ended up having amazing careers at Oregon. And we got there and the adjustment period was, I can't even describe it. I was, I felt like a fish out of water. I felt like I didn't know how to throw. I didn't know how to catch. I didn't know how to hit. I was like, do I belong here? How did I get here in the first place? And then I think it, you have this moment, it's like a sink or swim moment where um, you can either point the finger at yourself and say, I need to get better. Or you can point the finger at your coaches and say, I'm gonna transfer and I'm gonna go somewhere else. Um, because it's their fault, not mine. And I think that that's a huge problem in athletics right now is kids are getting softer and softer and softer and they have trouble being like, man, I need, I just need to get better. Like, that's it. So, um, I always tell people like coach isn't going to sit an all American on the bench. Like you just gotta push and, and point the finger at yourself, get working as hard as you can. And if you have a bone to pick then maybe you have a legitimate bone to pick, but 
at the end of the day, I think everybody wants to win, especially coaches when their livelihood depends on winning. Oh, yeah. um, and so I, I sat a lot my freshman year and I had a lot of people chirping in my ear, like, it's your coach's fault. It's your coach's fault. And I, luckily I have a really um, healthy relationship with my parents and they were like, well, what are you doing? That's not getting you on the field. And I was like, damn, okay, I'll get to work. And I'm really happy. I did. I'm happy that I um, grinded through it. And freshman year was, I mean, it freshman year felt like the equivalent of the last three years of my collegiate career felt so long, slow, and just brutal, 24 seven brutal. And then after that, I, I think I developed a true worth at work ethic and learned what my priorities were and what I wanted out of my career. And it took off from there. Gwen, I hear you, girl. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That freshman year, I was a walk-on. So I, I came during fall camp. Yeah. Great time to come. To, great time. So I get there and this is this is a moment that I knew. It was one of the first full pad practices. And I was playing end at this time, not in my position, totally new position. I had a guy 6'8, 360, staring right back at me. Oh, no. But yeah, no, this is crazy. So he goes past me. So I'm just like, all right, cool. Like, don't have to deal with him. Then Lamar Jackson comes to me. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, all right, it's us two right here. I'm like, what are you going to do? And in my head, I'm just like, don't bite on the fake. Don't bite on the fake. <laughs> Gwen, Gwen, guess what I did? You bit on the fake. I bit on that fake. Lamar goes streaking down the field. And my coach is right here, right here, the whole 10 minute period. So I'm like, you know what? Like, let me, let me get in my notes. Let me get in my book and let me, let me just get working. Oh, it's so awesome. Yeah. I feel like that's every freshman. I mean, there are obviously the, the 1% that don't have that experience and they're just, they transition well and it's, it's, uh, you know, smooth sailing, but I feel like it's every freshman. If you don't have that experience, I kind of feel bad for you. Like, it's kind of nice to be humbled and be like, man, I'm not who I think I am. Oh yeah. It is yeah. great. And like, especially like, I love how you said, like, you were talking earlier about like how kids are like kind of babies now they're entitled. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's a little bit through social media and like, you know, I've never really had a big presence, but I've seen like some of the biggest athletes with like hundreds of millions of followers get humbled. Yeah. And I would love to see like what people are like at that ground level. Like, yeah. can you get yourself back up? Can you start getting back on track? Cause that'll be the definition on if you are successful or if you're not. 100%. 100%. And so many kids, the, the answer is just switch teams, find a new environment, try to, but it's at the end of the day, like common denominators, you little man, little woman, like it's, you got to start, your, your destiny is in your own hands. Like, if you want to be great, you can be. It's just, what do you have in your toolbox? What do you need in your toolbox? And how are you going to get there? It's not anyone's fault, but your own. It's, I, I really feel like this younger generation is, they don't have coaches getting in their face anymore. And they, pay a lot of money for specialization lessons and um those people it's their job to make them feel good so it's like this the, and like you said social media is a whole nother animal that plays into it um and I, I definitely think it's softened this generation and then when they get to college it's reality check time and then you see who wants to sink and who wants to swim exactly yeah so let's talk about your sophomore you said you struggled a little bit freshman year but Sophomore year, was the job yours at catcher? No, sophomore year. So Janelle Limbaugh was in front of me and she was like the first catcher that I had seen where I was like, oh, I actually want to take part of her game and make it my own. Before I felt like I really like the way I do things, like maybe tweaks here and there, but she was ahead of me and I loved the way that she carried herself on the field. So I wanted to um, learn as much as I could from Janelle and she was better than me. So um, she played ahead of me my freshman, sophomore year. She was a junior when I got in. So my sophomore year, I was pretty much strictly a DP. I hit and that was it. Um, my freshman year, I was like, I played a little bit. I, my role really ended up becoming a pinch hit role. My sophomore year was when I played, I think every game for the most part, maybe, maybe uh, missing a, a few here or there, but I was a DP. So my job that year was just to be the best hitter I could be and to learn as much as I could from Janelle because I was the only catcher going to be in the program the next year. So I knew that the job was mine next year. 
Um, but yeah, in sophomore year, I had a lot more consistency playing, which helps always when you know that you're going to play. Um, it helps as long as you keep your work ethic going, right? So I developed my work ethic my freshman year, my sophomore year, having a little bit more stability in, in playing time was helpful. And that was when I felt like I started to really see my career move in the right direction, the direction I wanted it to go. Mm, yeah. And before, before we go any further, I got to mention this stat line that I, I saw when I was researching you. So three game series versus number 10 team in the nation, Washington Huskies. And everybody listen to this right here. So three home runs, one double, nine RBIs and five runs scored. And that would be great in and of itself. But this is the best part right here. 2000 slugging percentage 2000 Gwen Jesus Christ yeah, yeah you were on fun. one you were really on one <laughs> it was really fun that weekend I remember I was kind of struggling before going into that weekend and their pitcher is really good she plays in the pro league her name's Taryn Albello she's one of the hardest throwers in our game right now and I remember everybody was like just striking out strike out strike out against her and I went up there I was like you know what she's throwing a lot of first pitch strikes I'm just going to swing as hard as I can at the first pitch and we're going to see what happens my first at bat that weekend I hit a screaming line drive to second base and I'm typically like what you'll see in power hitters is they have a tendency to pull towards their dominant side I'm a righty so that would be left field shortstop third base and when I when I hit this screaming line drive at the second baseman I knew that my timing and my bat plane was all in the right place and I was like oh this poor woman I'm gonna have a really good week and then it exploded from there so it was that was I I think I told you this earlier but I think that was my best stat line on a weekend um my whole career at Oregon my freshman year I had one really I mean I had a great career but my freshman year I had a really great game against the Beavers but I think against Washington it's they were always a top team with us. We were always battling for the Pac-12 championship. So having that weekend against them was was really fun as well. And it was in Seattle, which is, it's so much more fun to beat the Huskies in Seattle. It's like, I would guess it would be like the Buckeyes beating the Wolverines at the big house, you know? Mm, yeah. So. Oh yeah. That's always, that's always a big moment for us. It happens. It's happening so much that it's like, all right, like beat Michigan again, like whatever. <laughs> But it's no, it's always a great, it's always a great time. Yeah. So Gwen, after, after that season, Team USA came calling. Now tell me how that went down. Yeah, I got, uh, it's so weird. I, I got invited to the tryout and I went and I did decently. I didn't do fantastic, didn't do terribly. Ended up making the USA elite team that summer. And then after that, I got invited the next year, didn't make the team. And then the craziest part is when I finally felt like I really got into my skin as an athlete and really started to develop, I, I didn't get invited back to USA, which hurts me, but also motivates me. So right now, Jeffrey, actually, it's it's funny that we're talking about Team USA. Um, I'm I'm been battling over the past couple of months, like, do I want to go for the 2028 Olympics? Will my body hold up? I don't know the answers to these questions, but having that summer and getting to wear those letters across my chest was so, I was filled with so much pride. And um, I just, it was, it was amazing. And I, I'm always wrestling with, um, you know, 2028 is, we're not in the 2024 Olympics for softball. That's why I say 2028. So it's a long way away. It's seven years away. It's like, I'll be at the, what's considered the prime of a female athlete, which is anywhere from 28 to like 32 ish. I'll be right at the end of that. So it's like, do I want to go for it again? Because I had that opportunity my freshman or my sophomore year when I was such a kid still. And now I feel like I really understand my craft and I understand the game and I have it between the ears in a way that I didn't have it in college. And so I'm constantly wrestling if I want to go for that again and get those letters back across my chest. But yeah, sophomore year was awesome. It was a great experience. Hmm. Well, Gwen, whatever, whatever decision you make, I know you're going to excel. Either you play or you do something beyond the game. I know you're going to be a big figure in sports. So just good luck and I'm praying for you on whatever you do with that. Thank you, my friend. So let's talk about senior year now. So after a junior year that saw you lead the Ducks to the College World Series, 
you know, what was your mindset going into your last year as an Oregon Duck? Oh, I had a I had a fall meeting with my coaches and they sat me down and they were like, they asked me that kind of, they were like, what do you want? I was like, I want to win a national championship, which is the only goal I didn't achieve in college. I want to win a national championship. And my, and my, they were like, we agree with you. And one of my coaches looked at me in the eye. She goes, why don't you want to be an all American? And I was like, I, I do. I just had never really thought of it. Like, I, I didn't know if I was good enough to think like that. And she was like, if you want to be an All-American, you need to work with the word All-American in front of your face. You need to make decisions that an All-American would make. And I was like, damn, I want to be an All-American. Like, I want to be an All-American. I want to be the best catcher in the country. I did have that goal. I was like, I want to be Defensive Player of the Year for the pack, which I didn't get because um, it's, I mean, the Defensive Player of the Year, she's a shortstop and shortstops just are have oh, they're such ballers yeah I'd, I'd imagine you'd go just like an infield player yeah it's it's a little bit easier for them to get it but I nonetheless I really wanted to make a statement that like I this is my position and I own this position this is who I want to be so um going into my senior year I finally like my coaches really helped me achieve those goals and have them actually have me actually say them out loud and say listen I want to be a national champion I want to be an all-american I want to be the best catcher and um, when we made it to the World Series, we were ranked one. We had the dream team. We had everything to win that year. Um, and we didn't. But I remember uh, like two days into the World Series, I got called into a press conference, which wasn't abnormal. I was um, kind of like the team speaker on the player side. I was always being pulled for interviews and things like that. So it was me and one of our pitchers. We were pulled into this press conference. That made sense to me. And we were sitting there and they, they were like, welcome to the All-American press conference. You, you guys have been named first team All-Americans. And I like literally in my mouth fell to the ground. I was like, what? And then I got told I was named catcher of the year. And it was so weird having my goals actually become real life things and having that feeling of accomplishment. So it's also helped me um, in my post-collegiate career, just everything that I do now, I'm like, okay, what do I actually want out of this? And, and what's the roadmap to get there? And, and, you know, like my coach said to me, you have to work with that in front of your face. You have to make decisions with that in front of you. If it's really what you want, if it's not, then that's fine. You're going to figure that out too. But, um, yeah, being named all American, being named catcher of the year are my highest, um, my most prideful words I've ever received for sure. Hmm. I love that. I love how you set your goals and like, really that's what I'm trying to do right now in my life. And like coming, graduating from college, like this is a big stage to do that. Yep. So just hearing your story of success and like, as you were talking, I was listening to you. And then I was thinking back in my own life, like I need to set a goal. I need to always keep that in the front of my mind. And that's, I think that's the most important part. Like you have to keep that goal in front of your mind as you work. Like hundred percent. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah, like, I can see where you go. I'm, I've been sitting here thinking like, I can't wait to ask him all these questions. Like what, are, what is your goal? What is, what is your plan? What is your, and whatever it is, it's achievable. hundred percent. You just gotta, you gotta, you know, mine your network. I know I talked to your class. You gotta mine your network and you gotta have that goal in front of your face. If it's truly what you want, you can do it. It's just, how do I get there? What, what are my steps? What do I need to do to get there? And it's, it's come up for me many times in my life, athletically and not. And having that there, it's, I've definitely had things where I say they're my goals and then I'm not working like they're my goals. And I realize maybe that's not my goal. And what is, and now I need to figure out what is my goal. And if it is that, then I need to change the way I'm doing things. I need to alter my behaviors and my actions. Mm. Yeah. See, Gwen, the thing with the thing with me is like, I'm a Gemini. I, my mind is always me like, too. really? Me too. Yes. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so like you get it. I mean, like my mind is always like here one time, like I want to be this. And then like the next day I'm like, you know what? Like that would be cool. But this right here, like, a, million okay. things, a million things constantly. And that's what I'm saying. Like there are things where I realize, oh, I don't want to do that. Cause I am constantly like, I'm like, do I want to open a bar? Do I want to 
change women's sports? Do I want to be a CEO of a company? Do I want to retire and get a van and travel the world? Like I, I am the exact same way. I'm, I'm a proud Gemini. I can't make a decision and I'm just very flighty constantly all over the place. It takes a lot more commitment from us for sure. Right. And that's yeah. why I'm so, I'm so happy for you that you were able to set that one goal in your mind and say, <laughs> I'm working to this. I'm working to this. No thought, no thought. You over here, you over here. No, no, no. I'm steady right here. Yeah, Listen, sure. I love that for you, Bruin. I love it. Thanks. Yeah. It's easy <laughs> but yeah, when, but, you're in, when you're in an athletic environment. It's hard when you get removed from it. Yeah. Cause the world opens up. Like yep. that's one thing I realized, like when I came to Ohio state, like there is so much more than sports. There's so much more than just football. Like it's, it's insane. Oh but so much anything you want to do you can do it it's so crazy what people do i hear jobs i'm like that's a job mm -hmm. that's so cool yeah it's, there are so many things the when, are let me tell you though let me tell you so one of my <laughs> first jobs coming from football was i got to work with the cincinnati reds i got to be in the dugout watch the games from where the camera angle is like i would just watch the games I take a baseball, I was an authentics intern. So I take a baseball from the authenticator, go back in the dugout, like go past the players, go in like the clubhouse area. That's so cool. Yeah. I would just, like shrink wrap the balls and then send them upstairs and I'd sell it in a store. So I got like so many great experiences from working with the Reds. Like it was sick. What a cool job. Right? Good. And like- the, deep in the sports world, man. You said what? You're neck deep in the sports world. The best is yet to come for you. Man, I, I hope so, Gwen. You know, like, I'm always just thinking, like, what can I do today to put myself in a position to where I can be successful in my future? I can give it down to my kids and yep. create generational wealth for mm -hmm. my family. Like, I want to hear more about Athletes Unlimited. Like, you guys are doing some cool stuff. So can you please yeah. just talk about that? Yeah, it's been it's been just the most amazing journey of my of my career is is happening on Athletes Unlimited. Uh, we're a network of sports leagues that are disrupting the traditional model of sports, and we're in the female sports realm right now because that's where the opportunity lies. Um, but that's who who knows if that's forever. You know, I think we have plans to expand into the men's realm right now, but it's really fun being in the women's realm right now. Uh, we launched with a softball, professional softball league, which was last August and September. And then we just wrapped up our professional volleyball league, which was from February through March in Dallas, Texas, with the best, some of the best volleyball players in the world. It was so cool to be around them. And we're about to go into our lacrosse league, and then we're going to have year two of softball. So it's been really cool. I started off as a player and I was consulting and um and then i finished my school i finished my grad school and i called the ceo i was like listen i want a job like this is what i want to do and so i work full time for them it's really cool if you were to think of like a fantasy based point system meets traditional sports uh, that marriage is where athletes unlimited lies and it's really cool we're giving a lot of women opportunity to play um in which they in ways they otherwise couldn't so softball and lacrosse this is the only active uh, league in the United States. And then volleyball didn't have, volleyball has a lot of opportunities abroad, but this was, um, again, the only opportunity for them to play in, in the United States. So it's really cool, um, having athletes celebrate being able to play at home and being able to perfect their craft. The hope is one day we get it so that all these women can be pro players and they don't have to be pro players and a teacher pro play, you know, all of us have to kind of supplement being able to prolong our career on the field or on the court um, by, by getting another job. And that's, that's the part that we're missing in the female sports realm is how do we get to the point of, of these women being able to be pro athletes, period. 
So it's really cool. We have a lot of visibility, a lot of top partners. We're partnered with Nike, with Gatorade, with Hyperice, um, some big names in the sports realm. And it's just growing and getting bigger and bigger. We're going to be on Fox Sports and CBS Sports. Um, we were on ESPN last year for softball. So we got a lot of momentum backing us for such a young uh, company. And the best is yet to come. We're, we're thinking about expanding to a fourth sport potentially. And, and what does that look like? So it's been really exciting. My life is totally in the fast lane, trying to manage a full-time position and still competing. So, um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It's been, it's been really great. And I'm going to plug us right now for anyone that listens. If you want to check it out at AU Pro Sports, it's, I, I really recommend it. We have athletes that range the gamut of sport, age, background, collegiate experience, um, international experience. We have, I think it's 28 Olympians across our, across our sports. So it's really cool. I recommend giving it a follow and, um, any questions I'm here for, but yeah, it's, it's great. It's been the best experience of my professional career is getting involved in this venture. That's great. I yeah. love it. I love hearing about this. It re- I feel like this could change sports like to be honest like because the traditional sports that we see like mlb like don't want to keep going back to that but like it's dying so like and and a lot of the research says that people follow a specific athlete like i'm a lebron fan but i'm not a lakers fan so it's 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 basically bringing that research to life like I can follow a specific athlete and not be nailed to a team because you have um I didn't say this but you have constantly changing teams so the top four captains of the week that accumulate points based on our point system are are now the captains for the next week's teams and they redraft so you're not stuck on a team there's no way for a team that's really successful to run its way through the whole league you know because typically you're going to get broken up because you're all performing really well. So it's a really brilliant model. Um, and it plays into, it, it brings excitement to the game. Every moment matters. Like you could be blowing someone out, but there's still inning points on the line and there's still, there's money attached to that. So it's like, it's, it's really interesting how much more exciting it's made all of these sports that are traditionally still fast and like softball is a really fast sport. Volleyball is a really fast sport. And like just having this, side of it has made it even that much more interesting that much more intriguing that much quicker um so yeah it's been it's been fantastic and um like you said baseball and it's like i said earlier like baseball college baseball for me is like watching paint dry and pro baseball it's like those guys are really impressive to watch but same it's long the seasons are long it's like i could tune into the back fourth of the season and still get the same experience i would um in the whole season and so anyway like I'm a Yachty fan. I, I don't follow his team at all, but I, I watch him play. I couldn't tell you anyone else on the team probably for him. Cause I'm a Marlins fan and that's pretty much it. Cause I'm from Florida, but um, yeah, it just, it plays into a lot of research that says that people want to follow their athlete. They, nobody really cares about a home team as much anymore. I mean, I'm sure there are people that like, I say I'm a Marlins fan. I say I'm a heat fan and I say I'm a Dolphins fan, but am I? Not really. I just, I'm from that territory and I like that territory, but I'm a LeBron fan because he was on the heat and now I'm a LeBron fan for life and everything like that, you know, it's mm-hmm. playing more into the individualist side of things, but it still keeps it a team sport. You, you get the most points from, uh, from team wins. So it's, it's a really brilliant model. And I, I guarantee anybody who's intrigued, um, if you look into it, you would be really fascinated by what we're developing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely check that out. And I love it because you guys are giving women a platform. Like you look at ESPN nowadays and like there's really, there's hardly any stories about women's sports or anything like that right now. Like there's a, I was in class yesterday and my professor was talking about the volleyball championships right now. Yeah. Literally no idea that was going on. Like I haven't seen any covers and like she told me that the only way that you can see it is by stream. There's no announcers or nothing. Yeah. Like, Gwen, what the hell? Like, it's that's really, not cool. It's really sad. And, and I have a lot of, when I get when I get into my passionate, fiery conversations about women's sports, there are a lot of men that like to come out and be like, 
well, women are less athletic and blah, 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 blah. And then I usually get a basic economics class when someone likes to tell me about supply and demand, like I get it. The problem is, is that there, like you just said, there's a lack of visibility. So people don't even know, people don't know there's a pro softball league. Like the majority of people probably don't know that. The majority of people probably don't know that we just launched the only US volleyball league in Athletes Unlimited. So there are a lot of things based on lack of visibility, lack of promotion, lack of partnership that cause this downward spiral of women's sports. And that's what Athletes Unlimited is directly trying to counteract. And, you know, we're getting these big partners, we're getting the visibility. So it's like, now we're starting to make steps in the right direction because we know the fandom's there. The NCAA levels have the fans women's basketball, softball, volleyball, the fans and the little girls playing those sports growing up right now, they're there. So um, it's tapping into that network and, and finding those people and get making it easy for them to watch, you know, not putting them behind a paywall, having color commentators and play-by-play -play guys on those calls. And that stuff is important and it, it matters to the way that a game comes across to people. So you're right, it's really sad, but we're trying, we're working our hardest. We're salmon swimming up river right now we're, and we're gonna get there. I, I think that there's also a wave of movement for women's athletics right now. The WNBA just had its most successful season ever. So I think that there, is, uh, there are people out there that believe in this. And I think there's a huge movement towards supporting women in sports right now. And hopefully it takes off and lights fire and and we're around to see it. So that's my yes, hope. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I love it. I love this. We need this. Like long overdue, but I'm so glad that you guys are making a difference. Like I love that. Yeah, like, it's great. I love being involved. I love you having me on here and letting me tell my own story and then chatting about this because those are the things that I care about most is, um, you know, explaining my process and how I've gotten to where I am and how my fire has been lit and and then my why, which is just, I want to leave my sport better than I found it. And by extension, I want to leave women's sports better than I found it. So that's the hope. And, and that's the, that's the goal in front of my face right now. I love it. Gwen. I love it. I love it. This was such a great interview, Gwen. Thank you so much for talking with me, accepting this meeting and just talking with you. I love it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Seriously. This was, this was a lot of fun for me, especially not knowing you and um, you know, going into a podcast with someone you don't know is always like, oh, well, this could go one of two ways. It could just be a Q&A where we get out of it. Or like, this is my favorite kind of thing where you have a conversation and you're learning each other's experiences. And we, this was great. It was such a great podcast. Thanks for having me on.